Welcome to this video on how to improve your schematics. In this video, I'll show you things you probably should and shouldn't do in your schematics to make them more legible, to make them easier for other people to understand, and also for yourself to understand when you come back to your projects in the future. I'll be going through a personal example of mine, which I hope illustrates some good schematic points, and also show you pretty much a commercial level schematic that isn't that great, and we'll see why that isn't great and what things can be improved. There's no particular order to this video, but I'll timestamp it to make sure you don't miss anything. These tips apply for all schematic and ECAD softwares, for example, KiCad, Eagle, but I'll be using Altium as I do in many other of my videos. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, you can follow the link in the description or go to altium.com forward slash YT forward slash Phil's Lab to get yourself a free trial as well as 25% off your license purchase. Thank you for your support and also the support from Altium. The first thing I'd like to point out with schematics is that it's good to section your schematics. So instead of just having a huge, you know, A2 or A1 page with everything crammed onto one single schematic sheet, it's good to spread it out. And this is particularly true for larger projects. I'm currently working on this ZET DSP, which is essentially a zinc based, so exciting zinc based system on chip device, which acts as an audio analyzer and tool for doing audio measurements. So it consists of this zinc system on chip, which is basically half FPGA, half processor. We have some sort of power circuitry, USB high speed, gigabit ethernet, a gigabyte of DDR3 low power memory, as well as a, a codec, which means ADCs and DACs, as well as some analog front end and analog rear end, so to speak. And this is kind of illustrated in a very simple block diagram way on this first initial schematic page. So I've sectioned things off into various schematic sheets. So I have all of my power circuitry on one schematic sheet, everything to do with USB on one, the Zinc stuff I've also split up into power, configuration, DDR, and so forth. And this way, I have a very quick overview. For example, if someone hasn't seen this project before, I can show them exactly what this project consists of. You can see I've also indicated schematic page numbers. And then also on the left in Altium, you can see I've started with a schematic page number. So I can quickly see, okay, the DDR part of the Zinc is on page 7. So I can go to page 7 to see that. So I would always start with a schematic overview page. And I've broadly, you can do this at a much finer granularity, shown what connections exist between certain peripherals. For example, the USB high-speed PHY or physical layer is connected via ULPI to the processing system of the Zinc, or for example, the codec is connected via I2S, and so on. Another thing to note just briefly is the bottom right, which is often called the title block. And this is good to show, okay, what revision number it is, how many sheets are there, and what sheet is this, who the engineer was who drew this, on what date, and the title of the page. So these are things that should pretty much be standard in larger and smaller projects. So let's jump to one of the first few pages, and this is the one of the power section. You can see I've got three distinct blocks, which I've separated with this drawing tool. So I've outlined a little box around different parts of the schematic. So I've done subsections when it comes to subsectioning the pages, so I've got a power supply page, but also within that schematic, I have then subsectioned that as well. I've also given a title to these subsections. For example, this is the quad buck converter and saying, okay, this will give me these output voltages, one volt, 1.35 volt, 1.8 volt, 3.3. And this happens to be for the zinc processing system, as well as for some other peripherals on the board. You can also see I've annotated quite a bit of text around it. So I haven't just placed this symbol, I haven't just connected up these various components, but I've also given kind of basic calculations of why I've done this. In particular, maybe these feedback resistors, how did I come out that I need 68K and 270K? Here's the formula, and this gives me to three significant figures this output voltage. Also saying what feedback voltage there is, and so forth. And a lot of this stuff I've extracted, of course, from the data sheet of this relevant part, but it's nice to just take the essential information and also put that on the schematic so other people don't have to dig through the data sheet for just brief checks. I've done the same, for example, to determine what resistor we use for the oscillation frequency, what tying these pins to ground means, and so on. Just helping myself in the future when I come back to this, and also why I made these design choices. And this can be a good sanity check. And this all starts with the schematic. Another point to note is, while we're at it, is that of symbols. So a good schematic starts with good symbols. Simply using, for example, the Symaxis parts libraries, you know, they're okay, but oftentimes the pins aren't arranged in a very logical way. For example, you might have pins which are laid out just like the pinout of the actual device. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, for example, in a SOIC 8 package, whereas you want to group your schematic symbols logically. So usually the schematic flow is left input, right output. So the schematic flows from left to right, as you would read most languages in the Western part of the world. Another thing is that we typically want ground, well, we always want ground facing down. 
So that's why I've connected this pin 33, which is the ground pad to ground pointing down. So all my inputs on the left, my VNs and my switch node outputs on the right. And I've been able to do a fairly neat job with the schematic because I designed this symbol correctly or rather neatly. In this way, I don't have much, much of these parts crossing over, I don't have much of these lines crossing over and so on. On the point of lines crossing over, you can see here, these junctions aren't that great. If I follow the power, buck power good signal through this 0 ohm resistor, what does this junction tell us? It looks like it could go up, down, left or right. So there's an option in Altium Designer to make little hoops, which they indicate that these signal lines are actually then jumped over. The way I do that in Altium Designer is go to Tools, Preferences, and on the Schematic General page, find the checkbox that says Display Crossovers, take that, and then press OK, and you can see this junction style has changed to clearly indicate this is not a connection, but rather we're jumping over this signal into the Enable One pin. So I would definitely urge you to turn that on in whatever CAD tool you are using. Let's move on. Remember this video is not in any particular order, but basically going through the schematic and see what we can find. Later on, we'll look at a schematic which I believe hasn't done a few things right or legibly. The next things are labels. The first thing is I encourage you or I strongly encourage you to label absolutely every single net name. And this is because this will be incredibly useful when it comes to layout and routing. For example, going to the Ethernet 5 page, you can see I have my RxD signals on one side of before the termination resistors. And on the other side, I've also done similar net names, except I've added phi into these net labels. If I just left them without any name in my PCB layout, these will just show up as, you know, net U925, for example. And that tells the layout or the PCB design engineer absolutely nothing about that net. That person will then have to go back to the schematic and see what that is. And this way you can save people a lot of trouble and hassle and make the layout and design process much more straightforward. If possible, you also want all of your net labels or all of your text to be horizontal. When someone reviews your schematic or if you're looking at your schematic, you don't want to have to you know, tilt your head sideways or anything or make it harder to read. It should be as simple as possible to read. So make sure your text is pretty much always horizontal if you can. You can also see my power and ground flags. So my plus 1.0 volts, 1.8 volts are all pointing up and my ground connections are all pointing down. I wouldn't put my ground, for example, like this, and I definitely wouldn't put my ground something like this. It's a good visual method of seeing what voltages are positive, for example, with respect to ground or negative. Another point when it comes to nodes is that I could have placed, for example, this 1.35 node over like so, but then I have these four bar nodes, and these are definitely not a good thing because this node will appear regardless if this pin is connected or not. So if I change my grid, make it slightly smaller, this node still shows up, but this in reality might not be connected. 1.35 volts might not be properly connected to the rest of these net labels, and you cannot see it in this way. Whereas if I move this over, and would have done that same connection, you can see this is clearly disconnected. So that's why you should always use three wire junctions at a maximum, never four. Another thing I see often is overlapping text. So for example, someone might have done a schematic like this and people think that is perfectly fine, it isn't. You want clearly legible designators as well as component values. And the same thing goes for net labels, right? I don't wanna put my net label something like this. This is bad practice and should be avoided. Another point is we definitely want components in the order they appear on the PCB and we want to really think about that when we're designing the schematic. There's a reason why C1200 is after this resistor divider here. I could have, of course, placed it here and, you know, functionally that might be the same or, you know, connection-wise the same. But this indicates to me or a PCB designer that you want R1200 and R1201 closer to the V plus pin of this op amp rather than this capacitor. Well, I actually have intended that I want the resistor divider first, essentially feeding through this filter capacitor and then ending up in my V plus pin. So order does matter in the schematic. You can't just arbitrarily or you shouldn't arbitrarily just hook things up. And, you know, even though the nets might be connected the same, a schematic always conveys a meaning. On the topic of bypass capacitors or decoupling capacitors, you don't want to have these decoupling capacitors, for example, floating somewhere up here and then getting rid of this. What does this capacitor belong to? I'm drawing my capacitor directly at the relevant power pin of my device. So this is, might be for this op amp here or something far more complicated. For example, this zinc power decoupling over here. Even though, for example, VCC int and VCP int share all of the same power rails, so 1.0 volts, I could have hooked all of these capacitors up together and tied all these pins together. 
But no, I want my schematic to convey a meaning and be especially, especially useful when it comes to PCB design and layout. I'm also saying, as before, that 308 should be closer to the package than, for example, C304. I want my, for example, high frequency, smaller bypass capacitors to be close to the package, and C304 can be further away. And already in the schematic, I'm conveying this meaning, and I find this an incredibly important thing to do. Another point is schematic coloring, and not all tools might support this. Outing Designer certainly does, and you can give various nets or net groups colors. And then we go over to PCB layout and routing, this will be incredibly helpful. For example, this DDR3 interface over here. I have all my DDR byte lanes, so my data byte lanes, color coded, so a byte each or eight bits. And for example, all my address command and control signals in a completely different color. And this will really help when it comes to layout and routing, and you could do that with the Ethernet files or any, for example, buses or signal groups you have. Also, when it comes to schematic pages, the reason I also give them different numbers or why we have different numbers is then we can perform annotation in a much neater way. So everything on page two will have, uh, for example, a two starting, so 200, page three will be 300, 400, and so on. So when I go from PCB design back to the schematic, if I'm looking for R400, all I have to do is go to page four because it starts with a four, and there we go, there's R400. So make sure also when it comes to annotation, you do it per schematic page and start in the hundreds or thousands, of course, depending on how many components you have. So now that we've seen a few tips on how to maybe neatly organize a schematic, and this is not just for the sake of OCD or, or you know, being pedantic, it actually serves a purpose. Let's have a look at, I picked a random example, but this happens to be from ST Microintronics. And while I, while I love their devices and I love their stuff, some of these schematics I would maybe do a bit differently. And let me show you why, or thinking back at the points we mentioned, why we should choose them differently. And this is from one of their evaluation boards for a USB-C power delivery controller. So let's have a look. First thing I see is why is ground not always pointed down? Ground to the side is not a good idea and they definitely would have space to either connect that to this ground here or point it down. I'm pretty sure VSYS would require some sort of decoupling capacitor which seems to be missing or it's floating around somewhere else on this page. Overlapping text, C31 is, we don't know, is that one microfarad? Is that 31 microfarads? Are these all one microfarads? Why is the microfarad hidden underneath, you know? And why is this C31? Why is this C1 and why is this C21? Also, not all of the nets are labeled. So for example, power PDO3 going to this gate is FET is labeled, but then this gate FET isn't labeled and this will appear some sort of net T30B whatever, right? Which isn't great when it comes to PCB layout and routing. Here we have vertical text, which isn't very nice to read. And also where does this go to? Where does GPIO go? I'll have to search through six pages of schematic to find this. Of course, I can use search functions or whatever, but you get my point. Also I have loads of these floating blocks of components, but they happen, I believe, to connect maybe somewhere over here, not entirely sure. So you see why it's important to place functional things close to each other. There clearly is a double wire here, so otherwise there wouldn't be a junction appearing here. Maybe you show the calculation for these feedback resistors or this compensation network, and so on. Here we have a case of wires crossing each other, even though, of course, it's kind of clear where these will end up going. It's better to use these junctions which jump over the wires to make it very clear. Also, we have a power label which is facing horizontally rather than vertically. Again, we have overlapping text, vertical net labels. There's no reason why they couldn't have just rotated these net labels and put them directly at the connector positions. And also on the note of test points, I believe these should be directly where they are supposed to be. So I want my test point directly at VBus or the relevant pins, not just floating somewhere. Also, there's no sort of overview page. We don't know what connects to what. And there's a couple of things I would like to see differently in a schematic like this. And if you just forage through a lot of electronic schematics, you will find a lot of these, which I believe should be in some way standardized or made a bit neater for legibility. Also to make it easier for the end user to be able to implement, for example, the manufacturer's device. So I hope this video was useful and I hope you can use some of these tips and tricks in your own schematics and make your life just that bit easier. Thank you so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.